Live with Hayley Miller and Andrew Black. Let's get more reaction now to a report from the Justice Committee on wide-ranging reforms to the legal system proposed by the Scottish Government. MSPs on the committee agree with the abolition of Scotland's not proven verdict, but they are split over plans to pilot a scheme to hold rape trials without juries. The government um, is one of the um, plans in uh, the government's overall changes. We'll speak to Thomas Ross KC in just just a moment. But first, let's hear from Sandy Brindley, who's Chief Executive of Rape Crisis Scotland. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. What's your reaction to the report, first of all? I, mean, I, I, I think this is a really solid report. I mean, the committee had a, a really big task on their hands to scrutinise this bill, which is very, very wide ranging in scope. And I think you can see from the report just how seriously they've taken the task that was put to them. And also what I'm really gratified to see is just how seriously they took the evidence they heard from survivors of sexual violence, just about how traumatic the current system is and why there's such a pressing need for change. And looking at uh, some of the aspects that were up for consideration, it seems the most contentious, certainly within the committee, uh, is this idea of piloting uh, rape trials without a jury. What is your view of that? Yes, yeah, so that, that, this was a proposal made by Lady Dorian, who is the second most senior judge in Scotland. And it, it's really against a, a backdrop of significant evidence around juries potentially using rape myths in their decision making. So like false assumptions are, are around rape or how somebody may respond to, to being raped. So how, do really, we, how do we know that, that jurors uh, do think that? Because... It's an offence to talk about your deliberation as a juror. It's an offence to ask someone about the deliberation. So how does anyone actually know that? There's, there, there's two, two different key ways that we have this information. The first is from mock jury research, where they what, what researchers do is they stage a rape trial and they have members of the public who are recruited to deliberate and they, they keep it as close to, to real um, jury circumstances as it's possible to do it and what is quite an artificial environment. So we have the evidence from that and that there, there is a significant number of mock jury research studies that have taken place internationally that have found um, significant evidence of rape myths and decision making. But there's also research in New Zealand with actual juries who sat in rape trials about their deliberations who also had the same finding in terms of the impact of false assumptions on deliberations. So what that means is that decisions sometimes aren't based on the evidence but based on false assumptions about women's sexual behaviour or how women might react to rape. It's, it's interesting because that really does suggest then that it, it, it's, it, it's, all of this is, is down to people's own um, biases, really. And, you know, I, I wonder if you, if you have a situation where uh, one person, a judge, is, is, is making that decision on their own. I mean, w could that judge not have personal biases as well? Isn't the idea that we have juries uh, based on the, the concept that judges are a bit removed from everyday life and, and, and society and might not understand um, how people live and, and what, what difficulties they face? I mean, I, I think one legitimate criticism that's been levied at the, part, the proposal to have a single judge pilot is just around diversity. But the, the pool of judges that we have is not the most diverse pool. It is, it's still overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly white. And I think that is of concern. But in terms of rape myths, it is far, far easier to be looking at education work with a small pool um, of people working within the judiciary than it is to try and transform the attitudes of the entire Scottish um, jury age public. Uh, but also, I think it's not only about false assumptions, it's about understanding of legal tests, legal concepts, what the concept, for example, of beyond reasonable doubt means. But, but a judge always explains these to a jury and always actually highlights that they should not... Um, fall into the, you know, uh, pay any attention to these so-called rape myths um, during a trial. I mean, they are given uh, direction on that. Yeah, no, they, they, they are given direction on that, but I think the difficulty is that these are quite deeply ingrained attitudes that we're talking about, particularly around women's sexual behaviour, which is often what's been, been played out in the course of, of rape trials and jury deliberations. And we heard from a number of judges during Lady Doreen's review, which um, preceded this um, legislation, 
put judges were saying that they see acquittals in cases where it's inexplicable in the face of the evidence. And I, I think that should worry us all. Okay, so you would be in favour then of a pilot with, with this style of, of trial without a jury? Yes, we, we, we would support it. I, I think it's also helpful, given the committee is split in this, I think it's helpful for the government to go away and think about are, are, are there aspects of this proposal that they can consider that might be able to bring people on board who have concerns around it. So some of the other ideas that have been mooted have been other models. So for example, rather than one single judge, you could have a panel of judges or you could have a judge and um, two or three lay assessors. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Labour would support a, a sort of a, a bigger panel of judges. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think there are, there are options here. I, mean, I think what the government will want to do is to reflect really carefully in this report and to think about is there a way of building a bit more consensus in some of the areas that the committee were split on, because this is a really important bill with a wide range and um, number of measures that could really transform people's experience of the justice process after a sexual crime. Okay. So I, th I think we really want to see, is it possible to get consensus in some of these areas that may be a little, a little bit more controversial? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sandy Brinley, thank you very much for joining us. She's Chief Executive of Rape Crisis Scotland. Well, let's speak now to the Defence KC, Tommy Ross. Thank you for joining us. Us, uh, on the programme this afternoon. Um, what are your thoughts then on, on what uh, Sandy, Sandy Brindley had to say? Yeah, can I first wish my friend Sandy a happy Easter? Uh, I, I mean, I disagree with quite a lot of the things that Sandy said, but I do agree with her that it's a very substantial piece of work. Uh, the committee have clearly uh, listened to a lot of verbal evidence and they have uh, received uh, quite a number of uh, written submissions and taken account of all of them. But uh, ultimately, the, the Justice Minister has had quite a long time to convince people that a pilot project of judicial trials is a good idea. And at the end of the process, or the end of this stage of the process, she hasn't managed to convince anybody who isn't a member of the SNP. Why do you think then that um, judge-only rape trials will not happen, e e even, if, even if it's just happens to happening in the pilot form? Well, I mean, there was quite a lot of evidence given to people who were completely impartial, people who were not lawyers, and, and they could see the weakness in the procedure. It's a huge, you know, Sandy said that the judges are overwhelmingly white. They're all white. You know, they're, they're all white. They're all born in Scotland, and the majority of them come from a sort of private school background, although that's changing over the years. So we get a fantastic pool of volunteers, people from Africa and Eastern Europe, people who have been here all their lives, people who have been here for five years. You know, you could land in Scotland today, and in five years you could be sitting on a jury in a murder trial. You know, it's a fantastic resource, and uh, I've never quite understood the basis for criticising it, you know. So I, I was always pretty confident that when a light was shown on some of the hyperbole that was thrown, the hyperbole that was thrown about uh, by uh, some of the campaigners on this issue, that uh, when a light was shown on it properly and it was exposed to proper study and cross-examination, the weaknesses of it as a project would be seen. I mean, you don't need to look much further than the Justice Secretary saying at the start of the process that the purpose of it really was to get more convictions. I mean, the, the minute the Justice Secretary tells the judges that the purpose of it is to get more convictions. The whole process is flawed from the beginning. Do you think there's uh, a, another approach then that should happen in terms of um, more convictions in rape cases? That is a long, long-standing concern but, that the conviction rate is low. Well, it, it's not a long-standing concern by people who practice in the criminal courts. I mean, we're, we're confident that the conviction rate exactly matches the number of cases which are proved beyond reasonable doubt. Now, Lady Dorian mentioned in the report that some judges are surprised by some acquittals. That's why we've got 15 judges. You know, that, that's why we've got 15 judges sitting as a jury, because one person might reach a conclusion which is impossible to understand, but the other 14 will outweigh and, and justice will be served. You know, if anything, it's an argument for, for, for preserving a 15-judge system rather than inducing it to a single judge system. As a, a speaking as a defence lawyer, then uh, do you think the, do you think the system works fine at the moment? Um, undoubtedly, there can be improvements. It's improving all the time. You know, Sandy knows that uh, 
the amount of evidence required in rape cases is changing in one particular direction. You know, cases which get to a jury in 2024 would never have got there 20 years ago. I think that's a, probably a positive development. The Crown Office are always undertaking uh, training to meet some of the concerns which victims have in terms of communication, not being kept informed, that kind of thing, you know. So this is an ongoing process. Everybody in the justice system, including Defence Council, wants to make it as less a traumatic experience for everybody involved as it possibly can be. But ultimately, ultimately, and this is often forgotten in this debate, there's somebody in the dock saying this didn't happen. You know, it didn't happen this way. I'm, I'm innocent. And, and that person has to, and it's usually a man, that that person has to have the opportunity to put to the witness that what you're saying isn't right, so let's have a look at some of the things you say. And, uh, you know, without that, there isn't a fair trial. Is there anything else in uh, today's report that's caught your eye? I'm really, really concerned, really, really concerned at the possibility that they're going to withdraw the not proven verdict and you could be away for um, 30 years imprisonment for murder on the basis of an 8-7 majority. Uh, as far as I know, that's not something that happens anywhere else in the world, not in Russia or North Korea or any of these places, you know, anywhere where there's a jury system, uh, anywhere where there's a jury system, there's an expectation that there has to be a weighty... I mean, in England, I heard somebody, I heard Andrew say earlier, Andrew to Kelsey earlier in England to require a 10-2 in the majority of a conviction. And that, that's right, but actually when the jury go out at first, they're told they need a unanimous verdict, so they need a 12-0 verdict for a conviction. And usually after an hour, two hours, three hours, something like that, the judge brings them back in and tells them that a 10-2 can be accepted. Now, think of that, you know, think of the percentage in England that's required for a conviction. And the proposal, as I understand it, is that in Scotland, you know, you could go away for 30 years for a murder conviction when seven people in the jury thought that you should be acquitted. That, that seems to me wrong. OK, thank you very much uh, for joining us on the programme. That's the defence, Casey Thomas-Ross. Now, let's get uh, 